Hello and welcome to today's event. Now I've got a question for you right off the top today, and that is, are you feeling sassy? If you are, you're in the right place because we've got a sassy event. By sassy, of course, I mean Secure Access Service Edge. And the event is called How to Start Your Sassy Journey with Cloud SWG. SWG. Now that's an intriguing title, isn't it? So let's get to it. Today's webinar is sponsored by Palo Alto Networks and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Keith Ward, and I'm excited to be your moderator for this special event. Before we kick off the presentation, though, we've got a few housekeeping items you need to know about. First off, we want this to be an informative event for you, so we encourage any questions in the questions box in your webinar control panel. We'll have experts from Palo Alto Networks standing by to answer your questions all through today's event. Now that Q&A panel is also the place to let us know about any technical issues you might be having. A browser refresh will fix most audio, video, and slide advancement issues, but if that doesn't work, let us know in the Q&A and we'll provide further technical assistance. Second, in the handout section of your webinar control panel, you'll find some important resources, including a link to the Gorilla Guide Book Club, where you can get access to actual tech media's information-packed resources on technology topics. Now, I'm personally a big fan of those, in part because I had a hand in editing and producing just about every one of them. You'll also find a link to the ATM Events Center, which has our calendar of upcoming events, and we've got some great ones in April and May, so check that out. Now, third, at the end of today's event, we'll be awarding a $250 Amazon gift card to one registrant. Of course, you must be in attendance during the live event to qualify for the prize. And the official terms and conditions of today's prize drawing can also be found in the handout section. Now, finally, one of the best benefits of these events is the opportunity to ask questions of our experts. And to help encourage those questions, we have a special additional prize for you. That's another Amazon gift card, this one for $50 for the best question. At the end of the event, we'll pick our favorite question that was submitted and contact that prize winner. And with that, it is now my pleasure to introduce Thanks, you. Thanks, Keith. It's a... Uh... Sorry about that. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our presenters from Palo Alto Networks. They are Charles Cho, a Senior Product Marketing Manager for Secure Access Service Edge, that's SASE, and Nithin Varam, Product Manager. So, Charles, the floor is yours. Glad you're with us. Now, take it away. Thanks, Keith. It's a, a real pleasure to be here and uh, to be speaking uh, in front of everyone today. And I'm uh, really excited to talk about um, internet security and what uh, we're able to offer at Palo Alto Networks when it comes to this security space. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, now, I wanted to just really start off by talking about uh, some of the, the changes that we're seeing uh, in the world today, actually. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to talk about is the fact that people are everywhere. And we uh, know very well from the COVID-19 pandemic and everybody working from home that it was a real change in the way that people worked. Um, and this real change has come across in significant uh, ways for the enterprise. Um, hybrid work uh, is, to be quite frank, here to stay. Uh, we conducted a survey just last year with ESG of over 300 networking security professionals uh, across all verticals. And we found that 60% of employees today are working remote, but more interestingly, that in two years time, so 24 months out, we're also seeing that they expect 61% to continue working from home or remote uh, in some type of remote capacity. So, it's still a majority of people, and we don't think that that's going to change. And the way that we have to think about this is that, you know, where people went to work in an, in an office building, and it was all about, um, you know, security stacks in buildings. And, and now we're going from that local environment to a completely global one. And as people continue to connect, collaborate, and create in new ways, um, it's really interesting because this changes the dynamics of security and connectivity. But in addition to the remote workforce and the hybrid workforce, we also see that, you know, there's uh, an impact to the extended enterprise. So what I mean by that is organizations are utilizing third-party contractors, vendors, strategic partners. These are people outside the organizations 
that need access to the same business critical enterprise apps and systems. And so all of this is connected through the internet. And um, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. And in addition to the fact that people are everywhere, data is also everywhere. And I'm sure this doesn't come to uh, anyone as a surprise, but you know we're seeing that data is now in SaaS applications. Uh, we're seeing data in personal devices as well as work devices. And that's causing a lot of risk um, for those of you that may not know, there was a data breach last year with LastPass where uh, I believe a high profile engineer had a personal laptop that was compromised and the threat actor was able to get credentials off a personal laptop and then go into the enterprise. And so uh, this interchanging uh, of personal and work that is also expanding the, uh, the surface area of attack and, and risk. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of devices like servers and IoT devices, all of these things are connected to the internet. So uh, when I say that data is everywhere, really we're talking about the fact that the external attack surface has expanded. Now we talked about people being everywhere. We talked about data being everywhere, but also threats are everywhere. And this is a chart that kind of illustrates the evolution of web attacks over the years. Um, you know, cybercrime today is very sophisticated. We all know that. Um, you know, it's really interesting when you see that some threat actors and some of these, these gangs, you know, they have support teams, they have research and development, they have risk and reward analysis. It's almost like a legitimate business, the way that they operate. And over the years, we've seen from like the early 1990s, if you look at that bubble on the left, um, you know, these attacks were mass volume, whether they're spam or junk emails, malicious banners. It was really a spray and pray type of tactic. And then in the 2000s, we saw that it became a lot more targeted, a lot more phishing attacks, polymorphic attacks. They became a lot more sophisticated by offering as a service, uh, offerings like ransomware as a service and phishing as a service. And then today, we're seeing that it's even more evasive, more sophisticated and widespread than ever. And we're gonna talk about that more uh, later on in the presentation, but some of the things to highlight are things like SaaS platform, phishing attacks, man in the middle proxy attacks, and hacker toolkits. We're seeing that some, some of these phishing toolkits are being sold on the dark web for as little as $5. And so that really lowers the barrier to entry that was once uh, very high uh, and only you know for the most sophisticated threat actors now novice actors can can really just buy these tools and they have a high degree of efficacy because a lot of these toolkits uh, i believe like 90 percent have evasive tactics in them and uh, one more interesting to note you know right now chat gpt is all the rave and uh, that really changes the game to a large degree because we see that a lot of these phishing emails where you could kind of spot a phishing email through mistakes and the way that they uh, you know, came across the English uh, language or command of the English language or any other language, that's now compromised because with ChatGPT, it, you know, it, it, it's almost as if it was written by somebody that uh, speaks that, that language naturally. And so these are some of the things that we're seeing in the market and it's uh, obviously impacting um, organizations today. So how, what, what type of impact to organizations uh, are we seeing? What's at risk? Um, I like to categorize it with the three Ps. Um, you know, all this change coupled with the fact that employees now generate and access more data that traverses the public internet really puts three main categories at risk. The first one is protection or the risk of a security breach. We know that poor security defenses will increase the risk of a data breach. Um, in the State of the Fish report, I believe that came out this year by Proofpoint, showed that 84% of organizations faced at least one successful uh, uh, phishing attack. And so that's 84%. I mean, you just imagine that, uh, you know, that number is so high. Uh, when it comes to productivity, what I'm talking about is the risk of business impact. Uh, poor user experience will impact the remote workforce uh, collaboration. Uh, we've seen in the same survey that I mentioned earlier, the ESG survey that we did of 300 professionals, we see that 83% have seen an increase in both security and connectivity issues as a, re as a result of their remote workforce. And then the last one, performance. 
This is the risk of operational disruption and downtime. Poor network connectivity and availability will impact IT operations. Uh, Gartner, according to Gartner, $5,600 per minute uh, can be lost due to downtime. We'll, we'll cover this a lot more uh, in the later slides, but uh, just imagine $5,600 per minute. So if you just have one hour of downtime a year, you know, that could be about uh, half a million dollars as an example. So we talked about all this change. We talked about change in the way that people work. We talked about change with data. We, we talked about change as it applies to um, operations and, and everything and, and threat actors. So why is this happening? Why are we seeing an 84% successful phishing attack for organizations? Why are we seeing um, you know, all this impact to business operations? Um, so the question is, SWIGs, secure web gateways, have been around for a long time. Internet security has been around for a long time. Why should this still be a concern for you? And why are we seeing this today? And with that question, I'll kind of hand it over to Nathan and we'll do a little bit of a back and forth and, and go from this point forward. Uh, yeah, thanks, Charles. No, that's that's a very interesting question, Charles, right? So uh, uh, to answer that, right, let's look at two popular ways the industry has tried to solve this problem. So we'll look at first the on-prem web proxies, and then we'll talk about the cloud proxies next. So first, if you look at the on-prem web proxies, right, um, let's unpack that in three categories, right? First is let's talk about the scale perspective, then we'll talk about security, and then the user experience. Um, so... If you think about this uh, on-prem proxies, right? They were built with uh, built on like a hub and spoke architecture, and these were created like in a pre pre cloud era, and they were never designed to support like the modern network architectures that are in demand, especially with the hybrid work uh, and apps moving to the cloud. Now, backhauling. If, if you think about the the back like the how it works, especially if your user is uh, remote, that you would backhaul all the traffic to an on-prem proxy that is sitting uh, in your data center. And that that creates, especially when users are working from remote and because of the hybrid uh, and the pandemic thing, the you they lose the dynamic and elastic scalability that comes in, right? So that's that's one of the main reasons why the, uh, the scale becomes an issue. Second is the, when you talk about the um, security gaps, if you look at the, the modern, um, the modern attacks and how uh, how sophisticated they have become. If you just create these siloed boxes, uh, where you know where you're depending on not just one solution, but but if, it, if let's say you have the uh, on-prem swig and then you have other solution for DLP, you have a solution for maybe a CASB, other solution for a sandbox. When you have like such a siloed uh, boxes sitting together and which are not integrated, it creates an issue to build a very consistent security. Um, especially with like multiple vendors uh, out there and not having not getting a good uh, not getting a consistent security across all of that right uh, so then lastly i would say the latency and the performance for remote users right so uh, especially with the backhauling um, you you run into two problems one is the a that you know um, if a user goes and let's say disables their uh, vpn then they lose internet security because there's nothing to backhaul and b the because now the uh, traffic is not going directly to the app it has to backhaul to the data center and then go to the app which is in the cloud now they they'll see a lot of these latency issues okay so that's that's on the on the uh, on the on premise web proxies <laughs> in a highway if you think about it it is literally these products are uh, are, are calling you in, into a box right now let's talk about the cloud proxies Right, so now moving uh, now, how some of the vendors in the industry have done is they've just taken this uh, old stacks we had and they just moved it to the cloud. Uh, so that's why newer solutions also fall short um, you know, from that perspective. Now, if you just take that and run it in a data center, uh, run it in a, in, in a cloud, then you're essentially just making it a rack and stack model, right? And it does not necessarily, it, 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 it elevates some problem, uh, alleviates some on-prem challenges, but it does not fully allow for full cloud scalability. Right? Like for example, uh, back in the uh, October, um, there was like a cable cut uh, that happened in France. And we have seen that some of our vendor customers got impacted uh, because of that. 
Um, second is we think about security gaps. We see that um, uh, they're not able to keep up with the uh, the evasive and sophisticated attacks. For example, things that Charles kind of mentioned earlier, um, um, mainly because of you know they uh, they have they lack the data visibility or inability to secure all the apps and all protocols and all um, uh, all ports that comes into play. Um, along with that. The uh, some of these are not leveraging the uh, AI or ML based techniques that are essentially needed to to kind of counter some of these uh, uh, attacks. Now, next, coming to the the user experience side, uh, one thing that we see is when when these vendors have moved the the uh, are offering the cloud solutions, they um, they share the data planes uh, in a sense. Like so, if you have a if you have a customer A and customer B, they both share the same data plane uh, in the cloud. Right, so which would which would cause your performance degradation. Also, from the latency perspective, it can uh, cause a noise enable issue. Also, we see customers uh, asking for, for example, um, when they have a um, uh, when, when when people are using SaaS apps, right? What customers want to do is they want to reduce the the uh, attack surface around the SaaS app, so they want to restrict those SaaS apps to specific IPs. Now, if 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 multiple customers are, for a given vendor are sharing the same data plane, then then the vendor is not able to allocate a specific IP dedicated IP to, to specific customers, right? Which makes the customers then they will not be able to uh, to lock or or, or or reduce the attack surface to the SaaS apps to those specific IPs. Okay, um, yeah. So 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 those are the two things. Just to double click a little bit more on the security angle. Um, uh, yeah, can I go to the next slide? Yeah. Uh, so, 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 uh, let me a little bit on security angle. Right? So, so if if you if you think about from the attacks, why the attacks are able to bypass the traditional swigs, one is uh, one 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 thing we see is that you know these um, these attackers are now using like clocking techniques to capitalize on the fact that the traditional uh, solutions only rely on a uh, crawling of web page content. Um, what what I mean by that is traditionally, you know, the uh, the the um, the, uh, the 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 solutions would traditional solutions would go and do an off rail crawling of a web page and they they say hey this is benign or this is um, this is benign or or, or 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 this is malicious right now what attackers are doing is they uh, they detect uh, if the request is coming from a, a web crawler versus a user and using that they f they show a benign page when a web caller making a request. So, so tricking the web caller to believe that it's a benign page, but when they see that the actual user is using it, then they'll show the phishing page, right? So that's the, um, so that's how by using clocking techniques, the attack is able to fool the, uh, or, 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 or misguide the traditional web solutions to believe that the content is benign. The, the second thing we also see is like, you know, cyber uh, criminals are able to bypass traditional specs because um, like some of these traditional solutions did uh, like use like a uh, hashes to detect the malware, uh, and it's easy for the attackers now to change the malware by changing few uh, few things in the file, and then uh, and then getting around the controls that they have. Um, third one also is uh, either, either because they they lack the these some of the AIML techniques, or they have the siloed data, or they depend on a third party, uh, for example, for the sandboxing or other techniques, uh, makes the the vendors to not provide a consistent security um, that can react in real time to the, um, uh, when the users go uh, uh, access a malicious content, right? Uh, for example, um, if, if you, just to give an example there, uh, let, let's talk about one of the sophisticated attacks that we see these days, right? Which is uh, using a COBOL strike. Uh, now, COBOL strike today was developed as a, as a red, test, red team testing tool, and by nature, it is supposed to be uh, not easily detectable. And now attackers are using that tool, uh, using using that to carry on the attacks, and and that's why they're able to bypass some of these additional uh, defenses. Now, a recent study uh, that was done uh, by the Secure IQ Lab. Um, uh, if you look at the report that came out um, some time back, it compared. The C, from the C2 perspective of COBOL strike, the protection that Prisma Access can give versus the other vendors can give. And you, you see that we are by far better than any, any other vendors out there. So th thank you, Nathan. I'll, I'll just kind of jump in here on the, on the next section. So you, you talked a lot uh, about 
you know, some of the um, the fact that attackers are a lot more evasive today and that uh, they can bypass traditional Swig solutions. Um, so if, if that is the case, and if that's uh, one of the reasons why, in addition to the fact that, you know, on-premise security stacks are no longer effective and just moving it to the cloud is no longer effective and all the things that you talked about, how should organizations, how should our audience here today kind of approach the problem? Um, well, we believe that uh, in order to approach the problem and, and have the, the right solution, uh, you really need to think about it from, from three angles. Uh, first uh, is obviously security. You must have the ability to stop the most advanced web threats, both in line and in real time. So you talked about offline crawling. It's, it's just no longer effective. You know, just these uh, cyber criminals are using uh, very dynamic uh, methods to bypass anything that's static, any type of static signatures. And so you need to be able to do it in real time and do it in line. Um, essentially, we have to be faster and smarter uh, than the attackers. Um, and uh, quite frankly, uh, organizations need to offload, offload those types of activities to a security vendor. Uh, rather than trying to do it in-house and, and trying to manage all the connections and, and all the users and access and, and do all of that in addition to keeping up uh, and keeping pace with the security threats of today is just, uh, it's untenable. Um, and so uh, you need to do it in line, real time, using AI to be able to detect the, the most highly targeted, evasive and sophisticated attacks today. So security is, is number one. Uh, in addition, you need exceptional user experience because what good is all this security if your end users, your remote workforce, if all these people that are trying to access your business critical applications can't access your applications due to unavailability, due to poor connectivity, due to all the, the things that we talked about, including like the, the cable cut in France and making uh, applications uh, inaccessible, then the business can operate. So there has to be um, a prioritization. Uh, it needs user experience today has to be a strategic priority for any organization. Um, and lastly, in addition to the user experience, in addition to um, the best security, you need to be able to reduce operational complexity. So we know that uh, organizations today are faced with so much complexity, uh, you know, with all these applications and connections and devices and uh, shadow IT in the cloud and just so much happening that is very, very difficult for organizations to have a real handle on everything. And in order for them to do so, you need to simplify. And uh, you know, we're not the only security vendor that says that simplicity is important. We know that um, everybody says so, but uh, we believe that we can deliver on that. And we'll, we'll discuss how we do that exactly. Uh, but you need to be able to reduce operational complexity and be able to deploy these solutions easily in order for you to have an effective uh, cloud swake solution. So, um, so with that, let me, let me kind of turn it back to the thing to kind of talk about our approach to uh, cloud swake. Yeah, uh, yeah, thanks, Charles. Yeah, so, so from our, from our perspective, um, Charles, like so Prisma Access, we, we are a security service edge solution that delivers a best-in-class cloud swake functionality. Uh, which also includes advanced child filtering, SSL decryption, SaaS application control, CASB threat detection, and prevention. Now, as the three things that you laid out, Charles, in the, uh, on the earlier side, as organizations look to improve the production, productivity, and the performance, uh, we can deliver these three uh, in, uh, in in these ways. So first is we we have uh, we provide AI-powered cloud suite that will help you stall uh, uh, or stop any zero-day web attacks in line, in real time. Right? So that's first is on security part. Second is the experience. So we provide uh, best user experience by leveraging the power of a, of a multi and hyper cloud uh, native architecture. And third is from the operation perspective, we provide a single unified platform that is easy to use and deploy. Now, what, what I'll do is like, let's unpack each of this uh, in more detail. So let's start with um, AI powered cloud security. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think these days there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, about uh, noise about the AI and ML. So first let's talk about what makes Prisma Access unique, right? So first is we're able to coordinate intelligence across all the attack vectors across the massive platform to stop exploit uh, exploits and zero day threats. 
so so first is like you know we for to make to for any ai or ml to be very powerful you need to have a good data and we uh, because of the palito networks uh, we have a uh, and, and the customers across if you look at all the customers that we deployed it right so we get a tremendous network effect with this we analyze over 3.5 billion uh, and unique events every day and then from the delivery perspective right if we use this ai ml techniques to provide a zero day detection uh, for example we detect up to uh, uh 2 225000 net new uh, and unique cyber attacks daily this will help uh, this this helps you to address the escalating threat landscape and with the ai ml we are able to 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 mitigate that right second is the inline threat prevention so we are not just talking about the detection we are talking about the the prevention and that to inline in real time now moving this direction in line will help us to prevent the uh, the, uh, the 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 first attack or unique or zero day attacks the and also uh, just one of the data point is like you know we from the prevention perspective right we are able to block almost like 5 billion attacks every day so nathan you 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 talked about kind of the the palo alto platform and just the power of our ai Um and I think this slide is is one level deeper where we can kind of focus a little bit more on the AI powered web security or the web protections. Um you know AI is a big theme uh, we we talk about AI from from begin to end in this presentation um but also across Palo Alto all of our security solutions uh is really powered by AI. And you know you mentioned it earlier about you know uh what goes in and what comes out the input and output uh that's really needed for for good AI. And on the right hand of the screen here you see you know we we believe in the 3 Cs uh, of big data uh, complete consistent and correct uh and what i mean by complete data is you know both we talk about scope volume and sources so scope it's not just you know synthetic data but we use synthetic and real web traffic data together right so we use real real traffic synthetic synthetic traffic as well as a massive volume of data that is all from all of our different um uh, sources into a single data lake and all of those different sources include security sd wan operational data from from everywhere including mobile users and branches and so all this data is collected into a single data lake that we can uh honestly say is a complete set of data um and it's also consistent So all this data has to correlate across all these sources that I just talked about. That correlation with the formatting structure and classifications must be there and it must be correct. And so it must be accurate and it must be aligned across all these data uh systems. And once we have these 3 Cs, then we have uh, amazing data that we can now tap into in order to drive the engine behind our AI powered web security protections. Uh, Nathan, can you talk a little bit about uh, what's under the hood when we talk about AI security? Yeah, yeah, j- just uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Asia. Yeah, just the high level, right? So if you, if you if you see on the slide, we 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 have like multiple techniques that we use we use today to let's say to figure out uh, uh, whether a site or a malware uh, or or any content is is it malicious or not, right? So just to ha- just to get a little bit deeper, like for example, if you pick deep learning. right where this helps is like for example if we talk about the phishing uh, attacks right we don't we don't just look at the url uh, but we actually look at the content of the page and then we can and also we use techniques like ocr to uh, to kind of enrich the data and figure out hey is this particular page is a phishing page or not and and all of this is not possible because we have the deep learning methods we can we can use to uh, use to do this So all all these uh protections uh, also has great security outcomes as you can see in this slide. And so I've only highlighted three but there are other areas like advanced threat protection that's that's not reflected here but I just wanted to highlight these three areas so DNS security, advanced URL filtering and advanced wildfire or our malware analysis uh database. So with DNS security um our ML models detect dynamic DNS layer threats and blocks them in real time. 
Um, all of these are driven by uh, AI and ML models. Uh, the DNS security, uh, we have 40% more DNS-based threat coverage than the next leading security vendor. Uh, when it comes to advanced URL filtering, uh, we're able to prevent new and evasive web attacks in real time. Inline deep learning models that uh, Nathan just talked about uh, inspect live web traffic in order to prevent the most sophisticated and evasive web attacks. Uh, and as a result, we're able to prevent 40% more threats than traditional web filtering. And then advanced wildfire, uh, the largest database and the fastest delivery of signatures with over six times that compared to virus total uh, and their total malware database of, uh, I, I believe it's 2.6 billion files. And we have six times that. So, and we also process over 50 million files daily from Prisma Access, as well as next-gen firewall, XDR, SaaS API, wildfire API, and Prisma Cloud. So all of these sources together really um, creates a, a huge database. Uh, the advanced wildfire database has 180x faster signature delivery compared to the competition. Now, Nathan, can you share with us what's new? Yeah, so we recently uh, launched like a three new ML power detections for phishing attacks. So, the, yeah, and these detections are automatically included in Prisma Access. Uh, just to double click on each of them. So first one, let's talk about the SaaS phishing detection model. Now, the problem this is trying to address is if you think about the advanced attackers, right? Uh, what they're doing is they're now using a, a less reputed SaaS platforms uh, with a high reputation so that they can evade the security vendors uh, to carry out the phishing uh, attacks. Uh, for example, right, like uh, if you look for a traditional way, you know, you would classify a page. Maybe you look at like the reputation of the page, or you look at like the hey, uh, the, the, when the page was created and and things like that, or when the domain was created. Um, now, now by using the by using the legitimate SaaS platforms, a they're able to get access uh, uh, because most of these uh, uh, customers might allow access to these legitimate SaaS platforms. Um, so, so that's why they're, they're able to uh, evade the security vendors more effectively. Now, our approach is that we not we don't just look at that usual phishing uh, indicators, like for example, suspicious domains or age of a page, but we also look into the content, right? So as I was saying earlier, like we look at the, we analyze the screenshots with OCR, we look at the source code of the web pages, and we're able to detect that these are actually phishing pages, uh, even though if they're hosted on a legitimate state platform, right? And we are, we are agnostic of the fact that it is a SaaS platform, which means even if a new platform gets added, we can automatically use our techniques to detect it. Now, all of this is being done with uh, in real time, uh, and 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 the, and the the power of these advanced detection models are helping do that. And and with this, we have detected over like thirty four thousand new net new phishing attacks per month using this model. Right, that's one. Second, uh, let's talk about the uh, so, so when a, the, the SaaS phishing model, while it is more of the ev ev evasiveness that you see in the phishing, the second one, the second problem we're trying to address here is about the sophistication, right? And one of the attacks that comes into mind is the uh, MI, uh, MIT man in the middle um, attacks. Uh, and and you have seen this. Uh, you probably have seen uh, there's a lot of literature uh, or, or blogs that were published, like from the Drop uh, from the GitHub Microsoft side as well, where they talk about this attack, uh, uh, this attack being uh, uh, carried on. Right now, uh, what do attackers do here? Right. So so what sophisticated attacks are able to do now is they're able to leverage like uh, like a reverse proxies to relay the original login page and steal the uh, the credentials and uh, as users authenticate, and why? And this makes it difficult because with the with with this kind of a state of atta uh, of attack, now the traditional ways how people prevent phishing, for example, using TFA. Now TFA can also be broken with this, right? Um, and that's the and they also evade like content based phishing detection engine. So that's why this is a very sophisticated attack. Now, our approach to this is that we utilize various HTTP signals to do this, uh, and we generate a unique uh, HTTP header signatures that will then use us to train our inline uh, uh, MITM inline model to catch presence of these attacks. Uh, now, and the advantage we also get is these uh, attacks of this nature can be analyzed and can be blocked in real time. 
Okay, that's the uh, that's the second uh, one. And then, so let's talk with the last one. The last one is the uh, the phishing kits. The focus here is to actually block the the widespread nature of these phishing attacks. So, if you see why are why are if you ask a question of hey why are attackers with limited expertise are able to catch all the phishing attacks, then it is all because of the phishing kits. Right now, with these phishing kits, they're able to launch the phishing campaigns in the in the in the minute, and that's why the phishing is becoming like very widespread. Now, uh, in, uh, so, so what we do here is instead of just looking at a page and determining if this is phishing or not, we can we can look at the uh, at the uh, source code and figure out hey, is this being generated by a phishing kit? Right, and we're using the uh, uh, and then we also have the kit directory attributes and 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 all of this helps us to generate a unique phishing kit level signatures that we can then use to train our phishing kit model and detects not just one page but but in any, any sort of pages that get created with this uh, with with a given phishing kit right now we are now we, with that we are able to isolate and identify multiple phishing pages um, and then address the problem at the source and and subsequently uh, any other phishing pages that gets built by this kit okay and 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 all these three uh, detections are available with uh, with uh, with Prisma Access uh, as a part of the advanced tool. Yeah, one one thing I wanted to add, uh, Nathan, if I can, is the, the SaaS platform uh, phishing detections. I, I think, uh, in addition to the fact that we're able to detect um, these SaaS uh, based phishing attacks, the model also identifies SaaS traffic as well. So we're we're able to accurately identify this web traffic as SaaS based. And if it is, we apply both uh, existing models as well as these new models on it. And that's what's really contributed is uh, identification of the SaaS traffic as well as applying these new models to it that has contributed to over 34,000 net new attack detections in, in a span of just one month. So that's, that's really exciting. Um, now, we talked about security and all the great things that, uh, that we've been working on when it comes to uh, kind of these AI-powered um, protections, but we also mentioned the importance of the user experience, um, and it's really important, especially if you're trying to maximize the business value. So I wanted to talk a little bit about our platform and, and how we can really deliver on the absolute best user experience for uh, our customers. So first, we, we have uh, the highest availability with 99.999% uptime. Now that's five nines of availability. And somebody might ask, hey, what, what's the difference between five nines and four nines? If there was 99.99, isn't that good enough? Well, if you, if you think about it, earlier we talked about Gartner and uh, their estimate of $5,600 per minute of downtime. Uh, we've actually seen higher numbers as well. Ponemon uh, in a more recent study show that it can be as high as $9,000 a minute. And if you're in a banking, healthcare, or manufacturing industry, or that verticals, um, you can lose an average of about $5 million for just one hour of downtime. And guess what the difference is between four nines of availability and five nines of availability? It's about 47 minutes. And so 47 minutes, uh, if you think about that in a downtime scenario with all the costs that we talked about, it can have a significant impact um, on, on the, the company. Uh, also, 10 millisecond security processing. We, we have, uh, we're, very, we're very proud to tell something called a single pass architecture, where it means that we're only inspecting the, the packet once. Um, and so not, we're not doing it multiple times with different types of security layers. It is done just one time, even if more security services are added, like, DLP, CASB, you know, all these other security services that we have, we will continue to just inspect once. And that is what allows us to have some of the lowest latency uh, metrics in the industry. So 10 milliseconds, and we have the industry's only SaaS performance SLA. And all of these numbers are backed by SLAs. And so you can imagine that, uh, that being able to provide the highest degree of availability and performance will ultimately translate into the best user experience. And how are we able to really deliver on this in addition to the single pass architecture and these uh, you know, five nines of availability? Well, it be it's because we have 
um, the leverage of some massive cloud uh, providers, hyperscale public clouds in the form of Google Cloud and AWS. And what we, what we have is a private instance across their private backbones with access to their private fiber. And all of that is load balanced and, and really gives us the ability to provide this global access to customers that really unifies their, their users, their branch offices, applications, data centers, cloud locations, SaaS applications, everything comes together and is optimized for the, for the highest degree of performance. Um, all of this multiple hyperscale cloud providers, what it also means if, is that even if a, a whole cloud provider goes down, they, our customers will still have availability because we have redundancy uh, with multiple cloud providers. And so there's talk about a zone failure, even with the cloud failure, we'll still be able to provide that level of performance for customers. And so that's really exciting. Just to add one, yeah, just to add one point, uh, yeah, sorry, just to add one point, Charles, there. Uh, I, I think we spoke about the uh, the cable cut problem that happened last in October, right? At the time, just as an example, at the time, Prismatch's customers uh, were not impacted and we were able to still maintain SLA. And, 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 and the reason for all of that is because we are using the the multi-cloud redundancy uh, between like GCP and AWS, and also we have multi-region redundancy, right? So because of this, the, we have we're able to keep the uptimes and not get impacted as customers of some of the other uh, other uh, vendors out there got impacted. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. An another benefit and another reason why we're able to provide such good uh, user experience is because of data plane isolation. And so here's a kind of a side-by-side -side visual to kind of show the difference between how uh, we're architected versus other security vendors or other uh, security solutions. You can see that uh, you know, we have multi-tenancy with dedicated data planes for every single customer. So what this means is there's no commingling of data planes. Uh, we know that uh, there's something called the noisy neighbor effect where if you know, you're, you're sharing a data plane with somebody else that is being attacked or, you know, has a DDoS or, you know, just, or, or their traffic is just fluctuating up and down. The noisy neighbor can generate so much traffic that it can adversely impact performance on your customers as well. Uh, so that's what happens with commingled data planes. And it's also a security risk. When you have a, a single data plane for all of these various uh, customers and verticals, it's a security risk in addition to performance uh, risk. But you can see on the left-hand side, the way that we treat uh, multi-tenancy is really optimized to, to make sure that our customers have the best user experience. Yeah, and, and then I think one example to add, one example to add here would also be the, for example, uh, if, if a customer says, hey, I want to log down my SaaS app to specific IPs, which they were able to do when everything was on-prem, right? Like now with, with Prisma Access, even, uh, even there in the cloud, the data plane is dedicated to you. So you get a dedicated list of IPs. So that way, uh, if a customer wants to, uh, you know, log down the SaaS apps, uh, they, can, uh, they can do that, which is very unique that we provide, which, uh, which uh, others are not able to provide because they have a commingled data plane that is shared across all customers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also want to talk about our kind of a, a single pane of glass. So we, we have these amazing dashboards that allow our customers to be able to monitor with a real deep insight and visibility. Um, you know, you're able to quickly isolate problems, improve user productivity, empower your support teams, conduct root cause analysis, and, and be proactive um, in notifying your users if there are performance issues. And you could do this all through a single pane of glass. What this allows you to do is really reduce uh, ticket escalations. It allows you to reduce uh, the ticket, the volume, the number of tickets that you're seeing. Uh, but most importantly, it, it also allows you to reduce mean time to remediation. If you're able to do that root cause analysis quickly, then that means it's gonna have less impact on, on your end users. And we know that performance does unfortunately have impact on remote users. You know, the more that uh, they're impacted with, um, you know, connectivity or performance issues, it, it could result in them turning off VPNs or doing other things to circumvent 
these protections in order for them to do their job. So they're not doing it maliciously, but oftentimes uh, because of performance reasons, they'll try to circumvent some of the protections that were put in place. And so uh, this single pane of glass UI allows you to do the, the, that continuous monitoring uh, of everything from the endpoint all the way to the application. Nathan, can you talk to us a little bit about Atom? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so so especially with you know users working from uh, from home, uh, one thing one thing happened is that IT admin suddenly they started lacking the uh, ability to visualize different segments in a service chain uh, or in the service delivery part. Like for example, if I'm at home and if I'm not having a good user experience, uh, while um, let's say I'm using one of the SaaS apps. Then for IT admin, it's really hard to understand, hey, is the issue at uh, my laptop? Is the issue with the Wi-Fi? Is the issue with the router? If the user was on-prem, they might have all these tools to, they have, might have tools to kind of analyze all of this. But when user is remote, it's, it's hard for them to identify or they lack these tools to help them identify or isolate the exact problem. Right? That's where the ADEM comes in. And ADEM helps you provide a deep observability no matter where the user is, whether the user is at home or at a branch. So we provide path, uh, uh, path to path and the performance visibility uh, for each segment with segment wise insights uh, and for all users and for applications, irrespective of whether the user is at home or the user is at a branch. Uh, so our, our SD WAN, for example, our, our Prisma SD WAN capability, uh, uh, sorry, for example, uh, Prisma, WAN, uh, Prisma SD WAN also have this natively built into it so that when user is at the branch, we continue to provide this kind of deep observability. Okay. Now the uh, the advantage also you get is, you know, with, with IT teams being asked to do more with less, um, they don't have to go deploy more tools for observability or management to understand this. Right? And they, they don't have to deploy any um, like, you know, additional appliance or a VM to make this work. All they need to do is to get this additional subscription uh, from Prisma Access and with just few clicks, they're able to get all of uh, this deep observability, okay? And then it's, it's not just that we stopped here. Um, I can go to the next slide. Uh, it's not just that we stopped here. We are improving uh, more and so there's something new that we're beginning to market is the AI ops powered ADEM. Um, um, so, so what this AI ops powered ADEM does for you is that it automates the detection uh, diagnosis and the remediation for all users and for all the application. Right? So for example, if user is sitting at home and let's say there's having a problem with Zoom call. Um, so the system is able to understand that a diagnosis, uh, understand that and, and provide you the proactive diagnosis for it. Right. And then the, uh, uh, and then it can also apply um, uh, auto correction or remediations. And it can not just for Zoom, but it can also proactively look at other applications, like for example, Zoom and share, for example, Gmail or SharePoint, and see um, and and test that proactively too. Right? So, uh, and then once the issue is isolated, then it can kick off the an automated playbook to to kind of remediate that particular issue. Now, early on, um, uh, customers might want to have a control of it, and then based on the diagnosis kick on a, on a particular uh, playbooks but what we expect is is in, in future as things go forward um, it would become fully autonomous in the sense the customers can if an issue happens and automatically uh, you know, a playbook gets triggered uh, to to mitigate that issue you know it's, it's really exciting to see that uh, the theme of ai is not just security but uh, it's coming across in operations as well so it's it's really across the board you know, one, one of the, the interesting things that, that you see here is the fact that, you know, we have a, a natural language interface. You know, I, I mentioned chat GPT earlier and we're trying to do something similar. You know, we have this uh, natural language interface where you can ask, hey, does such and such have access to Outlook? And, and it's going to give you an, a, an answer right there without you having to, tr you know, try to go into certain, uh, you, know, uh, you know, systems or different areas and, and try to find the, your answer. You just go straight to that chat box that natural language uh, user interface, ask it a question, and uh, boom, you'll, you can have your answer in, in, you know, immediately. Uh, in addition, you know, the, um, the native integration with uh, ITSM is, is fantastic with ServiceNow. So that, that's amazing. Um, so, so with that, you know, I want to pivot now. So we, up to this point, you know, we talked about security. 
uh, AI power security. We talked about you know making sure that we uh, provide the best user experience for end users. And now let's let's kind of talk about uh, operations and the need to simplify operations, um, whether it's deployment or whether it's using the product. And so uh, I want to spend a few minutes on this as well. So, so in this slide, you know, this is one just to kind of demonstrate or kind of visually show some of the operational challenges that organizations are faced today. Uh, when it comes to SWIG, you know, generally speaking, high cost and effort, especially for those that have on-premise uh, appliances or uh, SWIG proxies, um, and the lack of visibility into remote users, as well as having multiple point products. Um, you know, having a, a security stack on center for not only SWIG, but for DLP or for antivirus or, or whatnot. Um, I believe, you know, I, one, of, one of the customers that uh, we were talking to said that they had something like 14 different um, uh, on-site appliances for uh, a DLP solution. So you can imagine just the number of uh, complex, the amount of complexity that an organization is faced with. But with Prisma Access, we're, we're trying to do this differently. So we're, we're trying to alleviate a lot of this, this operational friction uh, that, that can be a cause of you know, intra-organizational conflict and really uh, offload that from the customer and make it as easy as possible so that our customers can really uh, focus on their business. Uh, and we're able to do that because uh, you know, we're able to reduce the cost and effort because it's no longer a hardware that they have to maintain, but everything is now cloud delivered with Prisma Access, number one. Uh, number two, you know, we have flexible connectivity options that we're going to talk about in just a minute. But those connectivity options, including agent, agentless, pack files, SD-WAN, really provides you the ability, provides cu our customers the ability to have that flexibility um, and, and that flexibility that is really designed for their environment. Um, single pane of glass management, we know that centralized, uh, not only a, a consolidated security stack, but also centralized uh, management uh, of security policies will go a long way in ensuring that there's consistencies, that there are no security gaps, and uh, everything is frictionless and seamless for our customers. So um, one of the ways that we like to look at this is the fact that Cloud Swig is part of a bigger platform, a unified platform, and it's a solution. Uh, quite frankly, it's not a it's not a product, but it's a solution that produces superior security and operational outcomes. And so, if you look at this slide, you know we're talking about Swig as one part of a larger story when it comes to DLP, Sandbox, CASB, Atom, everything, SD WAN. Everything is on this single Prisma Access or Prisma SASE platform, and everything is unified. Everything from unified management, unified policy, unified data, and all of that drives towards better outcomes. Um, our single unified uh, Global Protect agent really enables organizations to have like uh, to tap into an, an ecosystem of centralized security controls, uh, just that one agent. So. Um, it's amazing what we can do and, and the work that we put into making sure that all of our solutions work seamlessly. I'm going to uh, uh, give you a little bit of a surprise at the end of this presentation, so uh, just hang on. But uh, there, there is a, a little thing that we announced today that, I that I'm so excited to share with you that really reflects the, the power of a unified solution. Um, but in, in addition to that, you know, the fact that, you know, we have these flexible uh, connection mechanisms is, is really important because in the last couple of years, um, we've invested heavily on making sure that we fit all of our customer requirements. So, um, you know, we, you know, have pack file uh, configurations and, and availability, which makes it super easy for customers to just uh, change some settings in the browser and have that explicit proxy um, uh, requirement met. Uh, we talked about the single unified global protect agent uh, across all of our security solutions that, that uh, you know, require the agent. So things like the firewall and uh, ATOM and, and uh, uh, Cloud Swig, all of this uses that single unified agent. It's not multiple agents. We have agentless options as well, our clientless VPN, and we're doing a ton of work behind the scenes for the next generation of agentless technology, which um, we'll be happy to um, announced later on this year, as well as SD-WAN. So just uh, so many different connection mechanisms that really provide our customers the flexibility to, to get what they need. 
and uh, let's see, let's hand it off to Nitin to kind of cover what's next. Yeah. So, so, so from the uh, so from the new new capabilities that we're bringing into the project um, is the agent-based support for proxy. So, as Charles was telling earlier, we support pack file as a way to connect to a proxy in the cloud. Now we are putting bring that capability into the agent as well. So that will make it easy for further easy for you to replace any uh, proxy solution that you might be using uh, uh, with ease. Um, also, uh, what we see from customers is that they uh, when they think of the SASE journey, they're not looking at uh, replacing both, you know, like a Swig uh, use cases, their uh, private app access use cases, like a Cigna use cases uh, in one go. So they want to take a take a phased approach, in which case, uh, if they have a third-party VPN, then they can use this new agent-based proxy support to coexist very easily with that third-party VPN. Um, I'll cover this detail a little bit more in the later slides. And the last one is the hybrid mode to to then help secure uh, or give uh, always on internet, no matter whether the user is uh, enabling the private app uh, or not. And one other advantage you get with this is that the the for the private app access, you can go to Prisma access or you can go to your uh, uh, on-prem NGMW gateway. Uh, I'll cover these in, in more detail in the next slides. Yeah, so first one, let, let's take, uh, let, let's, uh, Let's talk about the uh, GP in the proxy mode. So first advantage you get right off the bat is that it helps you to replace any um, any existing uh, proxies that you might be using, whether it's an on-prem or a cloud. Uh, one, uh, uh, the advantage this uh, this brings you is that um, with, with just with pack files, right? Like you, the admin has to manage uh, or, or manage the pack files, distribute the pack files. So with the agent, all of that will go away. In addition, with the pack file, you're restricted to, let's say, supporting the browsers only, but with the agent um, agent approach, we can support non-browser apps as well as a proxy web. Okay. So, um, so that's one. And then, um, uh, Charles can go to the next, next slide, please. Yeah. So next is let's talk about the third party VPN, right? So you, as you're saying earlier, customers are on a uh, sometimes a journey to the SaaS uh, to, to to adopt SASE. So they they start off with uh, Swig while keeping their private access, which could be a third party VPN. While our current GP agent uh, can exist with a third with a third party VPN, but with the proxy mode, that uh, coexistence becomes much more simpler, much more easier. So that way you can continue to leverage your existing third-party VPN for your private app access, but for uh, you can then and consume uh, Prisma access for internet uh, internet security. Okay. The 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 next one is the uh, so the uh, like next next one yeah so next one is about the hybrid mode where we can use both the uh, the proxy as well as the tunnel that we we support today. So in the in the proxy mode. Uh, so, so what what this gives you is that with the for internet traffic you can use a proxy mode, and your for private app access you can use a tunnel mode. That way, if you want your users to have uh, your uh, private app access on on demand, like for example, um, they would log only when they log or they when they access corporate apps which are in data center, you they turn on um, they, they turn on the private app access for tunnel mode, uh, and then when they disconnect. Today, what would happen is what would happen is if, for example, let, let's take this example slightly different. Right? So let, let's take a, a customer who has deployed uh, uh, using an on-prem proxy, and then who has a VPN, right? And today, if they disable the VPN, if a user disables the VPN, then they lose the internet security as well, right? Now with this, that won't happen because what happens is with the GP agent. Now you have uh, you have two channels: one for internet security and one for your private app access. And even if you disable the, uh, even if the user disconnects uh, and disables the private access part, your internet secure channel is always up, and that will that will secure your internet uh, always. Okay, that's the this one. And then one other advantage uh, we see is for some of our customers who are using. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so, so we see some customers today. They want to use the um, their own data, uh, used our NGFW gateway, uh, which in their data center, uh, and then uh, for private app access because either they um, they they don't want to move the app to a cloud or maybe the, there is no 
no no point of person suppose max is in that location in that country so they 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 want to use our uh, njmw that way they will give the they can provide the the low latency app to the private app and then they can use the proxy mode on a gp agent for internet access so it is the same again hybrid mode where you have two channels one channel can go to prisma access for internet security that way you give fastest path to internet secured by prisma access and then the second channel can go to your on prem uh uh to your data center on prem and then that can secure your five private apps and provide the fastest path there okay uh, so just to summarize then um uh, next slide please yeah so so just to summarize then i think we so so if you have a uh, managed devices where you can use global protect and we support the proxy mode on the global protect um uh, if you want to replace if, if you if you if you if you have a reason if you have a need for using proxies to either meet your network or compliance requirements uh, and also if you are on the branch you can continue to you do that and if there are machines in the branch which are not uh, uh, let's say servers or iot devices where you cannot necessarily deploy agent even then we can secure the internet traffic um, using the uh, using the site to site ipsec that we can build from the branch to prisma access now if your branches are non default or branch we can without you having to do heavy network changes we can turn on the proxy mode on that site to site vpn so that we can uh, you can avoid your network changes you can keep the branch still as a non default route network and consume prisma access for internet security and then if you have any other uh, like if you have uh, unmanaged devices where you cannot deploy the uh, agent you can use the uh, our our client vpn solution to to so to to secure internet from there uh and finally quick note so 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 for some of the customers who who might already be using only tunnel mode to secure internet that is something that they can do that the, this continue to exist is not going to go away but if you have a um, this works well if you if you don't have a proxy requirement either for compliance or network use cases or you don't have a third party coexistence issue or you don't have to go to on prem gateway for private apps in all those cases you can still continue to use the the gp agent with the tunnel mode um but for the if you have the cases then you can use the either the proxy mode or the hybrid mode to secure uh, secure the user traffic for internet okay thank yeah. you for covering all those use cases <laughs> so that's a that's a lot of different uh, use cases um i wanted to just kind of wrap it up uh we're we're coming towards the end here um just to, with a quick quick case study of uh, a fortune 100 uh, pharmaceutical company uh this is one of many examples that we have of an of an organization that that really needed to migrate away from their legacy uh on-prem swig and onto prisma access for better security and user experience. So in this example, um you know, cloud migration was really the primary driver uh for this company and uh, they wanted to reduce their multi-vendor on-premise appliances as well as modernize their infrastructure um and make sure that everything is cloud delivered. Um as more and more tools that they were using in the applications that their remote employees were migrating to the cloud they wanted to make sure that uh, that the user experience was really meeting expectations when it came to um um you know their productivity and so uh, we were able to easily migrate all 100,000 users within just 3 months uh, without rearchitecting their network uh, they also leveraged the explicit proxy capabilities that Nathan talked about as well so so real good example of how we were able to do that successfully and and uh icing on the cake they also you know deployed adam uh to ensure exceptional user experience end to end um so really good story around there and and here's the the little surprise that i was saving to the end uh just today you know we announced that we are a leader in the gartner's uh security service edge or the ssc magic quadrant and we are now the only uh security vendor that is both a leader in Gartner's SSC as well as the SD WAN magic quadrant. So when you think about uh, a SASE uh solution or your journey towards a SASE solution bringing together the networking with the security, uh the only vendor that is a leader in both categories of SD WAN and SSC is Palo Alto. So with our Prisma Access and our SD WAN, we're able to to deliver on a true innovation and making sure that our customers are protected with uh, AI power. Uh Nathan, do you have any any words uh re regarding this? I know you put a lot of effort into making sure that we uh, made it into the magic quadrant. 
no, uh, no, we are excited that yeah, we are into magic quadrant and we are the only vendor who can do do both. Yeah. Or, or magic quadrant, uh, is, sorry, who's leading magic quadrant in both spaces, both in SSC as well as SSC. Yeah, so, so exciting. Um, so, so we're gonna, um, you know, just kind of this is our last slide. Uh, it, you know, if you want to learn more about uh, Prisma SASE, um, Prisma Access, uh, Cloud Swig, a lot of the AI uh, powered uh, protections and operations that, that we talked about today, uh, please take a, a quick snapshot of this QR code. Watch the on demand. Um, a video of our signature SASE event that we just had on April 5th and 6th. And so, yeah, just go there, uh, take a look, learn more about our solution. And uh, there's there's a lot more resources that you can find on our website. And uh, we thank you so much. And with that, I will turn it back to Keith. Thanks, Charles. That was an awesome discussion by you and Nithin of how to stay safe in the cloud. And if I may say it, there was so much sassiness. We really appreciate your time today. Okay, before we let you go, we have one more piece of business, the Amazon gift card prize drawing. Remember that you have to be present for the entire event to win. And the winner of the $250 Amazon gift card is Chris Schmitz from Wisconsin. Congratulations, Chris. We'll be in touch to get you your card. And with that, on behalf of the Actual Tech Media team, I want to thank Palo Alto Networks for making this event possible. And thanks, as always, for attending and for your great questions. That, everyone, is a wrap. Have a great rest of your day.